secondary animation as that which includes results from core character motion and classically uh, adds on top of that muscles, cloth, hair, and whatever else we want. Several methods exist for such assets, uh, used in isolation or combination based on the game type, platform, LLD, and so on. Savant is a pipeline for using known methods, applying principles of hyperpose. In case you missed these talks on recording or not being here, hyperpose is representing animation as one four-dimensional pose, sampling it to find PDPs, principal dynamic poses, and comparing them, merging similar ones together. I want to preface our solution with a review of the problem space. In no way I mean to diminish the value of work put in by the best art and tech people, and yet I must point out the tech-driven limitations we all impose on character design, specifically in relation to cloth hair and props. These design limitations are painfully common to concept artists, modelers, and riggers. They drive to keep secondary things tight and short when we can't animate them separately from the body. There are features we want but prohibit, and I call this display impossible characters, cases where we cannot support a design in a scalable and realistic fashion without substantial investment per asset. There is a hard limit on number of things allowed to move independently, so large folds and flaps will never unfold, and oversized and draping parts will hang over body, layered cloth will not slide, capes, hoods, and cloaks won't wrap correctly, long sleeves won't fit, and wide sleeves won't squish, skin-tight folds will stay static, and metal parts will bend and stretch. So designs with such features are best avoided. Even text-to-image generators obey these limitations, not always, but there's a distinct pattern, meaning things are worse than we realize. Our characters are designed to be rigid. So what should a proper secondary animation solution solve? We want realistic cloth, muscle, skin, hair props, reactive to runtime forces, cheap to run per frame and low in footprint, scalable quality and reuse for combinations, automated as much as possible, and yet artists facing for creation and iteration. The results should be stable and predictable, and the method should make sense to humans. Joint-driven solutions are straightforward, but rigid puppeteering is not the best way to achieve flexible shapes like transient folds or conforming to colliders. Pre-planned joint structures also present problems with scalability and reusability, and runtime physics get unpredictable, especially those involving collisions or ragdolls. Vertex physics look promising, but not for pinched or layered cloth, and density is never high enough for fine folds on crowd NPCs and character constructor outputs. Vertex cost per frame is a big quality constraint in itself, open to unexpected results at worst possible time. Common ML-driven solutions perform great for showcase videos, but there is no reaction with world physics. We can't do it for crowd, let alone on mobile. Common examples are skin tight for a good reason, to the point that we often call them should have been a normal map. <clears throat> in combination with some other assets, such as pants tucked into boots, is not supported. The black box nature limits artistic control and iteration, and unfortunately, most artists simply don't understand it. Neither do some developers, which I concede is not a tech problem. A blend space approach such as this one ends up with 27 states to solve and store for the simple range of motions alone, expanding to other body parts would grow number of states exponentially. To make things worse, none of these states describe anything resembling game poses. But this non-starter led me on a path to challenge the very basics. This starts with a pose and shape. What should the skin pose be? T pose serves to zero joint transforms at cost of built-in error. A pose and relaxed pose are educated guesses. Statement, we want symmetrical common pose, is a good start if we can provide the metric for common. Model-wise, what shape should the mesh achieve for cloth? Spread for rigging? Rest in 3D scans, something in between? Which folds should it have, if any? Again, arguments from gut instincts and not from metric. Same question for range of motion, why these really? One is made for skinning for extremes and tells us little about average error. Another is used for marker calibration on baseline movements only. Both are uninformed by actual game poses. What is correct topology and loops? Perhaps those informed by deformation capacity. Great, but even the zebra mask such as this one would not be adequate for non-articulated bodies which deform based on different rules. Post factum, we can reason about how wasteful we were with our geometry, but even this is based on aesthetic pose, not on performance over motion. And geometry has properties other than location. UV coordinates, for example, also have ambiguity. This problem in itself should have given us a big pause and a reason to think better. Another geo property is skin weights. Is this a good skinning or a bad one? And yet again, why? 
because it looks good in extreme poses, which have nothing to do with actual animations. How do we solve these ambiguities before we get to solving secondary motion itself? My claim is that our shapes, skin poses, topology, UVs, and skinning and such, they must be informed by more than one arbitrary pose. A good set of locomotions provides more than enough data to describe the vast majority of poses to be achieved most of the time. Such core set can be achieved early on and inform all future data. We're heavily basing Savant on hyperpose concept of concat trio, which concatenates most prominent PDPs of a large motion set on a short timeline. A median of weighted hyperpose then provides us with so-called fetus pose, which provides the lowest average error possible. I don't suggest we model in this. I simply claim that the model adjusted to this pose will have least built-in error when animated. In terms of cloth then, provided we simulate, capture, sculpt it over concat reel, we can find the best skin pose shape of cloth for any pose, including TA or fetus. The result is puzzling and uh, insulting to common sense, and yet it is accurate for the asset in question. Topology of dynamic object must be informed by its deformations over time. After all, we don't create 3D topology from one single 2D perspective. Soft objects have a wide variety in shapes they can achieve, and more shapes can come from art and, that, and get added to the core set. This is our way to allow complete parity between in-game look and concept art. So for the core set, we can identify the utility of each surface point of each PDP's deformation and collapse such utility maps to one. This result allows us to define the best possible topology for a four-dimensional object, which we perceive as three-dimensional animation. This way, we get the most meaningful topology and triangulation, not by eyeballing asset in some static pose, but by comparing errors over core set. Let's call this hypermesh. Everything here screams wrong. Notice extra density on areas which are currently flat. Notice unexpected loops. And yet, as the asset deforms, topology starts making local sense. I want to stress here that humans cannot create results of such precision. It's not eyeballable. Notice how little of the deformation happens on the silhouette, hinting we should offload inside detail to pixels rather than birds. The main requirement from birds is the ability to hold shape and outline without showing the polygonal nature too much, which can easily be achieved with subdivisions on rendering. This is not a mandatory addition. We can just up the triangle count, but the true power of subdivs, or adaptive tessellation, is not tapped into properly today, which I find extremely frustrating. We have a whole generation of modelers assuming birds are free, so spam away. While a well-topologized low-res model with subdivs is better than high-res. Better how? It's massively cheaper to store, stream, and run blend shapes per vertex physics, UVs, and skinning, and ML. It's easier to make, especially if we automate it, and might not even need LODs. It matches source sculpt better, regardless of the screen size. Displacement maps are not mandatory, and if used, they can be kept very low res. And if you think, nah, that will never work, Hazmat on the right has 1,000 triangles for the whole thing, and subdivs with no displacement maps. On average, a savant hypermesh is about 5 to 10% of production mesh triangle count. UVs adjusted using hyperpose provide more accuracy per any possible state. It's like relaxing UVs for all animation frames. Skin weights informed by motion also seem to make no sense, but these are not errors or bugs, it's a feature. Unlike human script here is informed by all class states over time. All savant assets that I show today are posed, meshed, and skinned using hyperpose. So how does it work? Say we take core set and generate cloth movement for it. We only need data for PDPs, not interim frames. We run Savant code to get hyper shape, mesh, UVs, and skin, and adjust if desired. We calculate and store inverse blend shapes in normal maps per PDP, Savant states. Don't worry, we're not going to use them all. We just store them. Let's simplify the view. We could use 12 Savant states, but we can replace PDPs with pointers, shrinking it to six or any number we want down to two. Cloth for skinned PDPs can be covered with LERP of savant states that we chose to keep. And if you think, nah, that would never work, Hazmat on the left only uses two savant states. Let me elaborate. We keep coming back to this visual because it's so succulent. Hyperpose suggestion of convergence set in this case is four PDPs, meaning that it's the perfect set which has best coverage and overshoot undershoot proportion. Using these four savant states would cover the range at best with lowest investment. We can override this and prescribe any other number and get instant report on new footprint and error. 
Our desired savant states are then packed on engine side per build or per level or per platform. They're invoked with metadata either coming from PDPs of hyperpose, which is super effective, or from animation curves of other systems and applied to mesh and shader in proper proportions on playback. Let's call this collection of savant states and weights savant sim. We've just opened up a ton of new options. For example, we can override savant sim with local static states designed for specific props like these shoes at next to zero cost. The resulting variation in combination power is immense. And again, savant sim is the same for all of them, meaning footprint is actually less than that of conventional solutions using extra assets. These local overrides can go really far and wide, completely transforming the asset visuals and they're added via a mix of masks, which can, can be combined and even animated at runtime. These masks can be stored as vertex color, low-res textures, or even come from world context based on distance, etc. cetera. Hypermesh being so low poly, we are not vertex count bound. We can even contemplate skin weight blends as part of savant state. Ease of creation and lightweight nature of local overrides prompts us to add versatility galore for different loadouts or props. We're also exploring an option of volumetric storage of such data, allowing not only character space offsets for it, but also native cross-asset reuse. But there's more. We calculate distance to body per surface point. This way, when we want to use savant set in a different volume character, such as the skeleton, a delta of new and base asset distance to body masks allows us to fit the garment to different body types and shape shapes at runtime. Yet again, I want to point out, we are adding one consistent lightweight asset, which can factor into runtime vertex shader, allowing full reuse of core savant sim, but in a new adapted way. Since we know the distance to body per surface point, we can factor it into world force effects, such as wind or gravity, working together with same savant sim. And using world normals, we can cling upper parts of garments to skin and sag the lower parts. As I said, we are only using core body joints and we welcome all sorts of sagging and draping. And we can safely react with all sorts of collisions such as walls, chairs, or red spheres. However, only to the extent the loose cloth allows this. No body penetration. Using the lazy comparison I've outlined in Hyperpose talk, we can even solve for ragdolls at runtime with LODs, although I would recommend analyzing ragdoll data to add as few samples as possible and keep the cost down. Speaking of costs, 100 characters on the left have no savant data, and 100 characters on the right have lots. It appears that cycle-wise, we're not free, but negligent. But we also have megabytes. There's a thing we call rubber footprint, meaning, meaning goal-oriented packaging, which assumes a lot of data is available, but only some of it makes it into the build, based on desired size in megabytes. Let me show how this works on example of textures. Baked textures are resized baked on, based on respective PDP effect, giving more real estate to those used often. Savant texture maps are constantly blended in and out, meaning their resolution can be kept extremely low. Areas marked zero store the weighted average for fallback. So we control different aspects of footprint. Texture resolution or number or blend shape number or max effectors per frame based on our specific bottleneck. We can have several versions of asset stored for different use cases. What is the effect of such collapse on quality? Now you tell me. Here we have a full-blown HQ versus dirt cheap version. Excuse me. Ah, oh, good. So again, full-blown HQ versus dirt cheap version. They both use 1K mesh, HQ with subdivs, LQ without. Two blend shapes versus six, two texture sets versus six, and the total size of all savant textures combined for low, normals, masks, and all, is 512 by 512. And I claim the visual difference is negligible. Also, we are looking at mobile asset. Same asset packaged differently. There are no subdivs on mobile, no advanced shaders, and yet we can run 50 savant characters not synced or instanced in any way. Although at that screen side, we could LOD them to smithereens and fit even more. Pipeline-wise, once a high-poly sculpt is ready, we script, pose it, and jump straight into simulation, capture, or sculpt. The result inform informs hypermesh, UVs, skin, and the textures are baked and packed. Savant states are thrown to the engine to be used based on target footprint of build. And at any runtime point for any pose, we have direct info about savant states engaged, meaning full transparency of debug. For a new or updated animation, we automatically calculate how well it is described using existing savant states, 
and we can introduce a threshold of when new things are appended to the concat reel and sent to simulation and notify your art. To recap, savant realism comes from Houdini, marvelous designer or 4D capture for cloth, muscles, hair, props, tentacles, layers, materials, wide sleeves, layered sliding, and sticking. It reacts to forces and objects. Thanks to rubber footprint, it's as cheap as we want in both cycles and megabytes. We get full combinatory power for character constructor. It takes the load and scripting side, but allows full control every step of the way. And finally, it is deterministic, so no nasty surprises. Which leaves us with the final question. Does it make sense? On one hand, I know plenty of artists whose ability to create fantastic art is not impeded by their complete lack of grasp on principles of PBR or normal maps. On the other hand, come on, it's just wrinkle maps and blend spaces in hyperpose. So this final question I leave for you to answer. We are now transitioning to our last five minute part to present the method we have developed for motion capture to feed all these wonderful systems with adequate data. <laughs> 